This episode was made possible by Wix, and we'll tell you more about them later in the episode. Today we're going inside a nuclear reactor. And not just any reactor, but the reactor that is used to make the rare isotopes of elements like berkelium, californium, the ones that are so important for synthesizing the super heavy elements. So this is an old reactor. And the reason why this reactor is here is because of a gentleman named Glenn Seaborg. He had a lot of work at Berkeley Labs and he had a vision of practicing that work on these heavy elements but he didn't have a great supply of it. And we can look forward with the hope that nuclear energy will become the servant of all men everywhere. He pushed the Atomic Energy Commission through the 50s, pushed and pushed and pushed, and finally, uh, of course, he won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1951. Then you get a little bit of credibility. And, uh, and he finally made some progress in the late 50s, 1958, and uh, the Atomic Energy Commission said, yeah, we want to do this. We want to build a reactor to produce heavy elements for you to do your chemistry. And so uh, the commission looked around the country at the time. And at that time, in the late 50s, there was a lot happening with nuclear reactors. A lot of drawings, a lot of designs being put on paper, particularly here in Oak Ridge. America's atomic city at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, has been open to the public. And even the opening was by Atomic Energy. Watch that tape. Oak Ridge had the only school that was specifically designed for reactor engineering. It was called the Oak Ridge Reactor Engineering School. And this gentleman who's on the wall, Dick Sheverton, has a plaque up here. He was a student in that school at that time. And he'd come up with a concept. And the commissioner of the Atomic Energy Commission saw this concept and said, yeah, I think this is the one. Glenn T. Seaborg needed a nuclear reactor with a high neutron flux so that he could get the elements to study. Up till then, he had gone to the sites where there had been nuclear tests and looked among the rubble for traces of these elements. And obviously, this is not very environmentally friendly. And there's a limit to the number of nuclear tests that can be done. And people are not very interested in doing a test just to make some exotic elements. In 1960, they broke ground on this site. And then they put the reactor building in and put the reactor in, and they were up and running by 1965. So for the first 20 years of operation, we produced these heavy isotopes, small quantities, but we produced them very regularly. We operated very regularly, and we operated often, meaning the, the total number of days we operated over the year was very, very large, 75%. Uh, now we operate much, much less. About 50% of the year we actually operate um, and our mission has shifted over the decades. Now our mission is neutron scattering, uh, condensed matter physics, but we still have an isotope component. We still make isotopes. So we got a big window. This is our bay. Uh, our reactor is actually uh, to the right side of the pool. The yellow bridge has a dam underneath, and that, uh, well, that doesn't have a dam today. I can see the dam is out. The dam has actually moved to the left. We're currently shut down for an outage, and, uh, but the reactor is in the pool on the right. Kind of, you see the stairway going down? That stairway goes down to a platform, basically, a grating. So we can lower that when we have the dam in place. We can lower that pool, and we can actually walk down there and perform uh, maintenance and repairs. In the pool is the reactor vessel. We're a pressurized reactor, so we have a very uh, sizable pressure vessel and then the reactor core is actually inside of that vessel. The vessel itself is um, uh, it's eight feet across, so what, two and a half meters? But the core inside of the reactor is where all the action happens. This reactor is designed to produce neutrons, not to produce power. It's not trying to make electricity like, say, Chernobyl reactor was. So it's small and it produces the neutrons at a very high rate, and then it burns out quite quickly. Each reactor core only lasts, at its proper operating power, about 25 days, less than a month. The reason we pressurize it is to increase the boiling point of water so that we can cool without boiling our reactor because we produce an enormous amount of heat along with an enormous amount of neutrons. What's the liquid in the pool? 
plain water. Just out of the tap, or do you purify it? Or? Slightly demineralized. There are still some minerals in it, but we do demineralize it. Water is all for cooling. All we're trying to do is remove heat. We produce a huge number of neutrons in ways that we can explain a million billion neutrons. 10 to the 15th neutrons uh, every second hit a square centimeter. That's just one square centimeter. It's a huge number of neutrons. So the pool water is separate from the water that's inside the pressure vessel. And the pool water remains at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The water inside the vessel starts out at about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. As it passes down through our reactor core, it raises about 36 degrees Fahrenheit, exits at about 156 degrees Fahrenheit, way, way below boiling. This is good for us. Power reactors, they want to generate steam but we don't want steam. Steam would be bad for us. We would like our water to be liquid. It, it's blue because there's so much metal in there. It really isn't blue. And we get that question often, but it's pretty, but uh, it's not like there's an additive. So this is a mock-up of our fuel. Our fuel is different. Power reactor, you know, uses fuel rods. We use fuel plates, but they're arranged in a very strange arrangement for compared to other research reactors even. Uh, our fuel is, is placed in these plates that are in here. These are curved plates. And we basically have two fuel elements, an outer element and an inner element. This part in here, which has rods, these are not fuel rods. These are target rods. This area is an area of very high neutron flux. So this is the business end of our reactor for making isotopes. When we make Californium-252, which you may have learned about next door, or Berkelium-249, uh, we make it in here, in the flux trap. The main point of the reactor is to have a tube in the middle in which you put your samples in fairly long, thin, essentially metal test tubes to be irradiated. And neutrons are important because these heavy elements can be formed by bombarding lighter elements with neutrons. These uh, fuel elements are mostly aluminum. But inside of these fuel plates is uranium. So we have, uh, U, uh, we use U308, which is uranium oxide, and uh, it's sandwiched in between two aluminum plates. So we, we basically protect the uranium, but allow it to cool very effectively by having these very small channels to force the water through. And that's why we raise temperature from 120 to 156. It all, all that heat transfer happens through these plates. So the plates themselves are about 24 inches, but the, the we call the fuel meat, the uranium, is really about 20 inches tall. So about 20 inches of fuel meat and, uh, and the rest is aluminum. Our fuel, actually the uranium, comes from uh, the Y-12 National Security Complex. And we get our uranium for free. However, the free part is uh, metal chunks and we can't use metal chunks in our fuel. So we have to pay to have our uranium converted to U308 oxide. So Y12 does that, they convert it to an oxide, and then our fuel is actually fabricated at uh, BWXT Technologies, which is uh, in Lynchburg, Virginia. They are the ones that take that U308 and they blend it with aluminum powder and they form these compacts. So basically the U308 and the uh, aluminum are blended together, they press it into these compacts these compacts are then put into this aluminum picture frame. So now you can envision there's uranium, there's aluminum in, this, in these middle sections here, and this is just all aluminum. And then we sandwich that with an aluminum plate. Then we take that plate and we roll it out. Then what they do is they form it into this shape. And this is a unique shape. This shape is called an involute shape. What makes that shape unique, it's the only geometric shape that you can stack around a circle and maintain a constant water gap thickness. You can't do that with a circle, you can't do it with anything else. It's, it's an, uh, this involute shape. So here on this dummy version I'm looking at, these are representing the fuel, the uranium. These like this, this like pretty fluted area here. Mm. Yep. Right. Yep, both these fluted areas are where the uranium is. That's where we generate all of our power, all of our heat, all of our uh, neutrons. And how are you making sure that most of the neutrons go to the center where you want them? I assume you want them to go to the center more than the outside. Well, you can't really control that. However, that's the, that's the amazing part of this unique design that Dick Sheverton came up with, is this flux trap 
He called it a trap, but it's really just a high concentration. There's no such thing as trap. You can't trap a neutron. But you can create a high density of neutrons, and that's basically what this does. However, those neutrons do go outward, too. And in fact, if we look at this mock-up, this gives us a more complete picture of the, uh, of the reactor core. So we have our flux trap that we saw over there. We have our fuel. We have a small region called our control region. And then we have a reflector region. So these are all annular regions. Our reflector region, this is necessary for the reactor to work, and so is our control region. The reflector is made of beryllium. And beryllium is a unique material. It's unique neutronically because when a neutron hits beryllium, on average, about two and a half new neutrons are made from that. They're lower energy than the ones that came in and hit it, but so you get two and a half neutrons. Some of those neutrons go back into the fuel and cause that fuel to fission more, and you build up this population of neutrons. Some of them can be used for experiments that are out here in the core, in the reflector. So you're just like, you're just like we've got this great neutron environment, and the scientists are like, what else can we chuck in there to see what happens? Yeah. yeah. So in fact, out here, what we generally make these days is we make plutonium-238 for NASA. So we start with neptunium, 237, and we irradiate those Neptunium targets for three of our operating cycles, which is about 25 days each. So 75 days of irradiation, and we convert about 10% of that Neptunium-237 to Plutonium-238. Then we take it to the hot cells next door that you just visited. They extract that. They ship it out to Los Alamos, and eventually it ends up in uh, radiothermal electric generators, RTGs. For example, like the one that's on Mars rover Curiosity, or the one that's going to be on Mars 2020 rover. Between the core and the reflector, there are plates containing the element europium, one of the rare Earths. Europium, in this context, is a very efficient absorber of neutrons, so it stops the neutrons from the core getting to the reflector. And the control plates are in two parts so that you can move one up and one down and adjust the size of the gap between them. So when you're ready to go, everything is assembled. The reactor is in its case in water for the cooling and everything is shielded. Then remotely, you can pull these control plates apart. And the outer one moves up and the inner one moves down and we create a window of communication between the fuel and the reflector so the neutrons can communicate. And we build up that population of neutrons, and then we finally go critical. Then what we'll do is for the remainder, however long it takes, if it takes 23 days, 25 days, 27 days, we pull these plates apart until they're all the way out. And once they're completely out and we can't maintain 85 megawatts, we shut it down. But at any point, if you, if you shut the window, the whole thing would go out, would it? Turns off. What's going on in the center where, those, where the rods are? So those targets, we do produce other isotopes. We make nickel-63. Uh, we make selenium-75. We make uh, californium-252. And then we also make some of these other elements, the, like the berkelium-249. What are the rods typically made of, or does that depend on what you're trying to achieve? It depends on what you're trying to achieve, but most of the targets, most of the components in the, in the reactor, and especially the targets, are, have, a, have a capsule housing made of aluminum. So most targets are made of aluminum. And then they have some material of interest inside. In the case of plutonium, like I discussed, neptunium-237. In the case of californium-252, we start with heavy curium, which might be curium-246 or curium-248. For selenium-75, we have selenium-74 targets. So we generally want most, most of the processes are to capture neutrons to get to the next isotope. We are fairly full, but we have a regular uh, routine set of irradiations that we do, particularly for isotope production. But we also do a lot of materials radiations testing in here 
we have a lot of materials for material science in that core. It's one of these, it lasts for 25 days. When we take it out, we put a brand new one in. Each one of these is about 1.8 million US dollars and it lasts for 25 days. So and then what happens, is it refurbed or that it goes in the, in the bin? So what happens is, so as I said, we're in an outage. This is a temporary just little cap to cover so we don't drop things in there. Uh, but this is our vessel head. This is the part that's about eight feet in diameter. Uh, this is the grating you can see that you can actually walk down the steps to get to. Not a lot to see here because we're not operating. Usually when we're operating, you can see a blue glow. You get the Shrenkoff radiation glow. So you slide the core into there, do you? Yes, so the, it's actually quite deep down in there. So we use very long tools attached to things and the operators uh, roll the bridge over and then they can lower the fuel down into the core location. Is that always an exciting day for you guys? Like, does everyone come out and watch and go, we're starting a new one, or is it like just routine now? Uh, I will say it's fairly routine now, putting it in. Uh, taking it out is more exciting, but generally that happens overnight, so not a lot of people come out overnight, but when you take it out, you take out elements that look like uh, you get the nice Cherenkov glow. Well, we don't have a lot of them right now that are glowing, um, but and actually, we, I don't really see many glowing. Usually we would have, these would be glowing, but they've been out for quite a while. We've had a long outage, so they've had time to decay. So these are old ones cooling down? Are these are old ones cooling down. They always stay underwater and they stay in this center section of the pool for maybe two or three years and then eventually they go over to these racks which are three tier so we can hold a lot of elements over here and then eventually they get shipped to Savannah River site where Savannah River site will dissolve them and extract out the good remaining material and recycle that into a program that supposedly makes power reactor fuel. I'm not very familiar with that program. But. How do you get the stuff out that you've just made? Like, you know, all that, all those cool isotopes that everyone's dying to get their hands on. How do you get them out of the, of the core and all those surrounding little cylinders? So that's, that is a challenge. And I will say that is what our operators do um, with long tools. It's like laparoscopic surgery to get these out. So it would be nice and you look at the top of this and you see these plugs and holes. Those plugs and holes, initially you think, oh, those line up with the, the holes that are on top of the reflector, but they don't. <laughs> the reflector is actually only about this diameter. Everything we do has to go through this one hatch. So they're working down there and they're going around things with these long tools. It's arduous, it's difficult, but they're very talented at it. So it is difficult to get things out, but we do. We do it routinely every cycle. And then they literally take them and they just keep them underwater. They drag them across to the other side of the pool. And then we can, uh, we can store them, we can put them in shipping casks, and then we can ship them over to the hot cells or wherever they're gonna go.
elements, while they're not producing neutrons or many neutrons, uh, they are still producing a tremendous amount of gamma radiation. So we use these. Uh, we have developed a small canister that can go down into that flux trap area, and we can uh, fill that canister. We can stream water or electricity or whatever we want into that canister. We can do high intensity gamma radiation. These are our control plates. You can see that I described the two cylinders. Okay, that was a little bit of a stretch. They are two cylinders, but the inner cylinder is one contiguous cylinder. The outer cylinder is actually made up of four plates. And you can see one of these plates here on the windowsill. That's a, an example of a control plate. These are very difficult to fabricate. They take a tremendous amount of time. They're very expensive. Remember, these have europium oxide inside as a meat. And uh, they take two years to fabricate a set like this. So when we do shipments, we can actually back a truck in here and it comes right over to this area where these gray squares are. And we can use the big crane and bring the big shipping cask and set it down. The shipping cask for Californium 252 targets is quite large. It's a nine foot diameter sphere that they've painted white and call the cue ball. It weighs 25 tons, so it's not, it's not insignificant and uh, it can get set onto a truck. It's very exciting when they ship Californium and plutonium targets are shipped in the same, in the same cask. I was really impressed that they're using this reactor for all sorts of different experiments, not just making the new elements. They also have beam lines coming out from the reactor generating beams of neutrons. The reactor core is that way. The beam, you can see the red lines designate three beam lines. There's actually a fourth one on the far right that doesn't get a red line. So we have four beam lines that come down and they actually get split even further because we have more than four instruments out here. So these large tanks are called SANS tanks, small angle neutron scattering tanks. They get evacuated. There's a detector plate, a large one meter square detector plate inside. And they can use the beams of neutrons for what are called neutron diffraction which will allow you to do all sorts of interesting experiments. The one that really excited me was that you can take a diesel engine, like for a car, and you can image the fuel being squirted into the engine block by shining neutrons through the block of a running engine. And because the fuel contains hydrogen atoms, which absorb neutrons strongly, you can see this jet of fuel going into an engine when it's running without disturbing any of the workings of the engine. Have you seen our new Periodic Videos website yet? We made it with Wix, which is the sponsor of today's episode. This is what it looks like. And if you're creating a new website, or maybe ditching an old one because it's become a nightmare to maintain, then you really should have a look at Wix. Their drag and drop interface makes designing a website so simple, elegant, it's actually kind of fun too. You can stick pretty close to their huge range of templates to get things going, or you can go really deep with customization, tweaking every tiny little part of the site. You can even customize things I didn't know existed on a website. They've got everything. Go to wix.com slash go slash periodic videos. Use that slash periodic videos so they know you came from here. Whatever you're doing these days, you really should have a website and Wix is the place to go to make it. Wix.com slash go slash periodic videos. Woomera is in the middle of South Australia. Woomera is actually an Aboriginal word for a throwing device and that's no, why they're appropriate. Yeah, because launching rockets and things. Yeah. yeah. The black stump. So here they are taking all their supply. Australian servicemen and scientists played a big part in the operation, which included the construction of a tower. The tower that vanished instantly when the atomic weapon was exploded on it. 